uh, I'm I'm on the final episode. Um, you are? Yeah, like I'm watching I'm watching the final episode. I'm not I wasn't on it. <laughs> oh, 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 no, okay. I'm I'm watching I'm watching the final episode. Yeah, Whew. it's intense. Cinema Therapy Podcast with Sam and Mitch. Er, er, Dad. Welcome to the Cine Therapy Podcast by Inland Film Co. I'm Mitch Williams. This is episode 8. This week's installment is different from the others we've recorded. I was honored to be invited to present in front of Leonard Oakland's documentary filmmaking class at Whitworth University. And Sam McGee, our DP, joined me there and filmed the presentation. So this week's episode is a recording of the presentation I gave to that class, and I hope you enjoy it. A quick note, I shared two documentary shorts we produced in front of the class, so if you're listening to this, you can find the links to both of those films in the description of this podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, we included them in the cut. Regardless of where you're listening, enjoy. Uh, Mitch, uh, what years were you at Whitworth? Uh... 05 to 09, and then I had a fifth year to do. So I dropped out for a while and finished it in 14. So, okay. so yeah, so. So you were really class of 09. Class of 09, for with sure. some extra, and uh, how did you go from a Whitworth graduate to uh, a filmmaking career, a video? <clears throat> it's a long story, but I'll try to sum it up uh, quickly. I, I was always into film. I took any filmmaking class that uh, Leonard had. I took a couple. Uh, independent study classes with Leonard on screenwriting and I in summer of 09 I worked at North by Northwest on a feature film called The Ward by John Carpenter and at that time it wasn't the digital film world that all of us are used to today it was still very much um, more focused on film and at that time if you wanted to get into filmmaking like the word on the industry was like we'll start out being a PA you know running coffee and doing random stuff. At the time I was like, well, I'll make films someday when I make money, after I've made money. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I got into software uh, for seven years, uh, worked at a couple startups, started um, one of my own, and then worked at another software company for like nine months in 2017. Sam McGee back here, my business partner, uh, is also my brother-in-law. He's been a, a freelance cinematographer and director of photography for the past like five years and he brought me on a couple projects that he worked on and I was able to step into director mode again and producer mode and that was the time where I was like I got to get back into this and uh, luckily he had already spent the money on the camera um, <laughs> so uh, so yeah so I, I joined Sam and I uh, formed Inland Film Co in October of 2018 and so we're just over a year working together um, and so yeah it's a that's kind of like the long so or the condensed 2018, that's this year. or 2017 17, 17 thank okay. you 2018 yeah so my head's already in 2019 yeah. so yeah <laughs> you're, you're scheduling ahead yes yes so yeah okay so you have something you want to show us to get us started yeah, I figured I'd, um, they say in a presentation the best way to uh, gain the, the audience's attention is to show credibility. And I guess the only way I can really show you that I'm a credible source of anything film related is I might as well show you some work. So uh, again, I'm Mitch Williams in the Film Co. This is a documentary short we produced for um, <clears throat> the ARC, the ARC of Spokane. They work with uh, people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities gain employment and so we just produced this for them this summer. Um, are we able to get those, that yes, backlight off as well? Once we got there we found out he was a speaker and so he didn't get a, a room at the host hotel, instead he was at a hotel like 10 minutes away, which when you're in a wheelchair is fairly significant. I got to, during the days, ride with him back and forth. His love of movies and Star Trek and you know just the things that he's passionate about that he wears on his sleeve is so awesome. And finding out that he communicates the way he does with Morse code I think was just like one more like notch on this nerd belt that was so great. I just love it. 
special project over there for students with disabilities. Meeting Paul for the first time was a earth-shattering moment for myself. I had no expectations. I knew that Paul had a disability, but I had no idea how we were going to communicate. Were you an honor roll student? Yeah. Wow. I believe that too, Paul. Mm -hmm. I believe that too. Is that how you live your life? Uh, yeah. Me too. Mm -hmm. As a new member of the ARC family myself, I have had the opportunity to meet a wide variety of folks that we serve, but Paul is different in that he is an advocate. He truly embodies the mission of the ARC and that is to achieve self-sufficiency and self-reliance, to be able to experience life to the fullest without barriers. In the privacy of his home, he just unleashed this brave soul with a gentle spirit. <laughs> he's funny, he's actually, he's, he's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sitting down comedian. <laughs> that's, that's rich, that's good. <laughs> As someone who supports individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, I believe each of us has the opportunity to be an advocate for this cause. We are privileged in life through many shared experiences to each hold to our own story. And the people that we are supporting, these folks, have incredible stories just like each of us. And we have the opportunity to walk alongside of them and to culture an environment where they can achieve success to the fullest, where they can live full, vibrant lives despite challenges, despite their disabilities. Go to the gym. Mm. Mom bought a pony for you? Yeah, yeah. They are human beings with beautiful, tenacious spirits. Paul impacted my life in those brief moments uh, tremendously. It was a spiritual encounter for myself as we were meeting with one another and talking about everything that he experiences in life from wanting to build his own institute to serve people like himself yeah. with disabilities wow. and to further them in their employment success. Um, he is employable. He has his bachelor's and his master's of social work. And he is just an incredible human being. I, I'm, I'm lost with words to describe Paul because I'm, I'm a lot, yeah, sorry, a lot less with words. I love that smile. You have a great smile, Paul. It's infectious. Huh? Thank you very much. I'll start with I'll start with just the stereotypes we have with nonprofit work. Um, positive for us is, I'll start with positive. Positive is those are our favorite stories. Um, anytime we've worked with nonprofits, we've done a couple for Children's Miracle Network um, and then a number of other nonprofits in the area. <clears throat> um, those are our favorite stories. I mean, you can, you can really gravitate towards the story and the only way to make a solid film I don't know if you guys liked it or not, or if it was okay, uh, but um, is if, if you fall in love with the story. The stereotype that I was going to mention is uh, nonprofits usually don't think about their fundraiser until like 30 days before a fundraiser. Uh, so we got reached out to this uh, almost four months in advance, and we were really excited because we thought we'd have all this time. and. Uh, as we tried to nail down filming, it wasn't until like three weeks before the event, three, maybe just a little over three weeks, that we actually got to go shoot. Um, <clears throat> and so um, nailing down interviews um, and the time, especially with somebody uh, with a um, developmental disability, 
you know, it's like finding time, finding their, their, the caretaker at the place to open up the home um, for us to come in and, and whatnot. Um, and then really, from a development standpoint, we work on a bunch of commercial projects, a lot, and when you have that short of deadline or turnaround, um, that's when it becomes difficult. So we actually had to like map out and get all of our commercial work done before we started editing, and we edited that in like a week um, before it was due. Um, and so it's uh, for us, it was like you really want to clear your schedule. I don't know if this makes sense to anybody. If if you haven't done any commercial work, it can get in the way of like really cool work. <laughs> so um, it's uh, front loading your schedule so you can turn it around. Um, I will say another additional piece is we went in with the goal, you wouldn't know this by the film, but we went in with the goal of only using Paul's voice, <coughs> meaning his uh, Morse code and him talking, uh, or like his, the noises he would make with his mouth, and he rarely used, used his computer to speak, like with that um, robotic voice that you heard at the end. We went in with the intentions to only use his voice, and as we cut the film, we realized that we needed uh, um, a, a guide, I guess, to tell the story, and that idea of a guide comes from this um, idea um, that's completely separate, I'll hit on later. But we used Angie, the developmental um, communications coordinator or whatever. We used her voice to kind of like help be that guide. So does that, does that help answer your question, Leonard? Does it, did anybody else have any questions about this specific piece of work? Get some. You have a ton? Yeah. Can I just rattle them off? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what is uh, the rate um, that of film versus what you used in uh, the actual film? How much did you actually film versus what was put into uh, the film? What's that rate called? <coughs> Shooting ratio. Shooting ratio. Yeah. Um, so that's a four and a half minute or five minute, I think, documentary short. And for that specific film, we probably had three hours of footage. Um, so, but we're unique, I think, to a lot of um, production houses uh, in the sense that production houses uh, that we're familiar with go in with shot lists specifically. We always arrive with a shot list, but we never let the, like, we rarely cut the camera. We, we keep it rolling. Our internal mantra is always be rolling. Um, there are a couple documentaries I'll um, point to. Has anybody watched um, The Jinx, uh, a Robert Durst um, story? It's a, um, it's a murder mystery. Watch it. I won't give it away. But the very last scene of that, they kept the camera rolling, which also kept his lav rolling. And he goes into the bathroom, and they catch, like, all of his darkest secrets, like on, on audio, um, because they kept it rolling. Um, so <clears throat> I'll use, for example, at the start of that, you saw a gentleman sitting in his office talking about Paul, and he says, the first time I met Paul, I was driving a bus, and he, we went on. Um, Sam had started recording, and I mentioned to him that we, we were doing a documentary short on Paul. And Luke just casually started talking about Paul, uh, in, in this awesome way. I mean, and so K Sam turned the camera and was locked in on him. And Luke just kept pouring out about how awesome Paul is. And he speaks with Morse Co. with his feet. And then like a thir two thirds of the way through whatever he was saying, he locks eyes with the camera, sees the red lights on, and he starts stiffening up and, um, and starts becoming robotic in his response. Well, then we asked him to talk about Paul again, and his whole second response was super robotic and uh, chest out and deep voice. Um, and the cut, the, the clip that made the final cut was the first where we didn't have the overhead hypercardioid. It was the shotgun mic, which we hate. We don't hate it, it serves a purpose. But if we're gonna do in indoor uh, interviews, we have a specific microphone we always use. And, um, but the content was way more valuable there um, even though we didn't have lighting set up the way we wanted, his response was more organic and natural. So, um, so again, that, that goes back to the always be rolling. Like, camera was recording the second we stepped foot in somewhere. Um, so, 
Um, uh, do you, how often do you do these kinds of interviews like you'd have with Luke? And more specifically, why I want to know is how often do you think it usually takes for people to get out of that stiff robotic uh, form when, when you're interviewing? Yeah, so the question is how long does it take to get people out, like, comfortable on camera? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll start with that uh, <clears throat> camera back there. We put a piece of black tape over the recording light um, in the last couple months. And so when people come in for interviews, we're recording before they've even stepped foot. I mean, not always, but like the second they step foot in our studio, we're recording. And they sit down, we ask them, you know, casual questions. What did you eat for breakfast today? And that's usually to get mic levels tested. Uh, but it's really a casual conversation. And this happened with another documentary short that we did for the ARC. We did three. And... Um, <laughs> We got all this really quality organic content from the guy, and then he goes, "So are we rolling?" We're like, "Yeah, <laughs> like, oh, we, we are." So, um, uh, we've we've uh, artificially um, gotten that by putting a piece of tape on, but people still do um, struggle with the comfort once they start, and it really depends on the person. I would say you're going to find more authentic, more organic. Um, responses later in the interview. Um, I'm going to show another documentary short uh, that we did for Children's Miracle Network. Not right now, but later. And we'll, we'll, you'll um, find in that there were three docu or there were three interviews that were done. Two, we did not um, perform ourselves. We didn't lead the, the interviews. And one, we did. <clears throat> and our style with questions is asking very open-ended questions. Um, questions. If you ask a question that's a yes or no, you're going to get a yes or no, and it's not going to have much weight in it. And um, we also are not quick to um, ask a follow-up question. We let them sit on the first, first question that we ask, and they might answer it, and then they might start thinking more about it, and then they like dive deeper into their response. And that's when we find we get the most valuable and most organic responses, I guess. So, um, somebody else? Anybody, anybody else? Keep, yeah. keep going, yeah. Okay. Um, so are, are, are most of uh, the things that you guys are working on locally based then? Uh, you're getting a lot of your offer various contracts. I don't know how you said in contract. Um, correct, yeah. So most are local, uh, but we do a lot for um, local chapters, I guess, of organizations. The ARC is a national um, organization, national brand. Um, uh, Children's Miracle Network, very national, but we worked with their local chapter. So we work with some construction, um, labor um, oriented brands, uh, Old Castle Precast. They're headquartered out of Dublin, or no, they're headquartered out of Atlanta, and their parent company is headquartered out of Dublin, and we're doing work for their Spokane brand that's made it to corporate, and um, our, we'll, we'll be meeting with their corporate offices in Atlanta in um, January or February to talk about some more work. And So it's kind of like, yes, local, but <laughs> we're working with Boise Cascade, another second largest plywood manufacturer in the world. Um, we went to Kettle Falls. Um, it's a little drive from here, a couple hours, but um, you know that's a little more local, but we're working with their national brand on it. So you have another one? You're, you, by the way, you're, the people who asked your name was? Uh, Dylan. Dylan, cool. Josh. Josh, Mitch, cool. So when they, when they asked you to, to do these specifically this spot, did you kind of have an idea that you were going to focus on uh, this individual, or was it did they say, hey, this is a guy we want you to focus on, can you tell his story? Or did they arc say, hey, we want a, uh, a video, a uh, little documentary, uh, and you guys kind of just did a lot of digging? I guess, how much is them telling you to do stuff versus your own artistic freedom in this? <coughs> Uh, so to start, the first part of the question is, uh, how do we choose Paul? 
And then the second part is, is you know how much creative freedom we had. The <clears throat> in the first part, they they had a list of I think twelve names. I mean they work with, um, they have a. Uh, $13 million operating budget, and 80% of that comes from families who pay for their, um, their kids um, or loved ones who have intellectually or developmentally disability people to come in and have like corporate sponsors that will like take them to Sweeto Burrito and help them gain employment that way. Or uh, we, we did one short on a, a um, young woman <coughs> who has an intellectual disability that started working at a law firm as a clerk and but she had a sponsor that kind of helped bring her in that environment and since then she's she no longer uh uses the arc for her ser their services but she's like a success story she's like she makes it to work on her own and all that kind of stuff um so we had about uh, a dozen names paul was the only one that we said we absolutely want to do um the other couple um the, the, we're, we're happy we did them, but if they, get, if they chose some other people, we would have been fine. But Paul's, I mean, how cool of a story is it, um, you know, to have a, a man in his, you know, 60s that has been living with this um, his entire life. The software that he's using to help him speak is the software that was written for Stephen Hawking um, to be able to speak in his chair. And the only reason he's not using Stephen Hawking's uh, I um, tracking software is because Paul can't um, he can't control where his head moves like his neck so he has to stick with the Morse code but anyways it's just like really cool um, really cool story so if we find a story that like we're like we absolutely have to dig dig into this then we'll put um, we'll 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 like make sure it happens the next one I'll show you is it was going to be done by a news station <clears throat> and when we heard that and CMN, Children's Miracle Network, saw the work we were doing for another documentary short. They're like, oh, there might be some difference in quality. And we're like, well, we'll do it. <laughs> and it was, so uh, anyways, and we got really excited about it. How much of the Paul story was our creative and how much was their? Correct. Their that's, that's, the last, that's the last part of your question. Thank you. How much, was the, how much of Paul's story was the creative or any of the stories? We rarely have, um, I can't name a single documentary short that you and I have worked on where we didn't have at least 80%, 90% of the creative freedom. There are all, any documentary short you work with, or any, any nonprofit you work with, wants their name, their brand name uh, to be featured in there. Um, and, you know, why their brand or why their organization has helped this person. Um, and so uh, we had the, I mean, 100% creative freedom on, on Paul's story. And it was, it was awesome. Um, the, there's one thing I was going to add. I'll think about it. I don't want to sit here and think too long. How did you choose four and a half minutes? Uh, did they tell you the length they wanted? Yeah, so they wanted three that added up to five minutes. And then when we went and filmed between three different stories, we got about eight hours of footage, <clears throat> and we ended up having 11 minutes in a final full length, the three stories adding up to 11 minutes. So we had to tell them beforehand a week before the event, we're probably gonna be closer to 10 minutes. And we only did that because when you run a fundraiser, you wanna know how much time you're allotting for things because people are on schedule. And so we, we did that just out of courtesy. And, um, and also, we were not gonna cut his story short or any of the others short. Um, we cut them as short as we were willing to. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and so it ended up being partly around we wanted to be concise and to the point and not like drag out a long story, but also we wanted it to we wanted to have it long enough. Um, it, we wanted it to be the perfect length where the story was told 
and nothing that we, we did cut a lot. We, it was probably 10 minutes long before. Um, and I'm, um, when I cut personally, I usually cut a longer director's cut and I have Sam come in and uh, be the bad guy uh, yeah, and say, what, what, what do you want to cut? And, and, I, and I know half the time if I have this long, lengthy intro, I know it's going to be cut down to like, <laughs> so. Uh, but with, really quick, I'll come to you. With that, well, part of the creative on that that I was really excited about was the intro and the ending. And the intro, we like, we didn't show Paul's face, you know, once. You were like, you hear him talking about this guy and how cool he is. And um, that was a really cool thing for us to be able to reveal him after the fact. Um, so you get this suspense. Well, who is this person? So, anyways. Um, I remember a, a shot in there with him, Paul, uh, as a kid on the horse. And I don't remember if it was you filming like they were showing you that or if you actually got the footage. Did you, did you get the footage of that? <coughs> We asked for the footage. We did not include it in there. We we kept over his shoulder him showing us. Oh, okay. I um, don't remember what was around it. Yeah. My memory was kind of maybe telling me that you like. I don't. I don't know. I was imagining you like converting film or something. I was like weird. Yeah. No. No. We. It was a. It was definitely our camera okay. captured that. And what was your name? Sorry. Yeah. Hannah mm -hmm. Mitch. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yeah. So we. We're not opposed to including other people's footage. There has to be a purpose, and how you include it in a film, I guess, for us matters. We don't ever want to look, try to act like something that somebody else shot is ours. We want it to be stand out on its own. And yeah, okay, Dylan. How often do you go to archival or other people's footage? Uh, that's a good question. Rarely. Um, this next one I'm going to show you, we, we took some and it, it had to play a role in um, the, the film, in the story, because there's a historical component. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so it's rare, but we do. Um, we usually frame it in a way that it stands out on its own. This, it was the most awful footage from a news station, so it stood out on its own because it was, well, we shoot everything in 4K, we export everything in 4K. This was played in 1080p today because 1080 plays better on projectors like this, but um, it stood out on its own regardless, so, so yeah, yeah. But I want to work with more archival footage. Have you watched Wild Wild Country? Have you seen it? Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's Sam and I. Uh, I'm I'm on the final episode. Um, you yeah. Like I'm watching. I'm watching the final episode. I'm not. I wasn't on it. <laughs> oh, 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 no. Okay. I'm I'm. Watching I'm watching the final episode. Yeah. So I'm watching the final episode right now, and uh, whew, it's intense. You, you kind of explained you guys' roles. Um, uh, towards the beginning of class, uh, but as a director and a, uh, is a director of photography yeah, as well, um, what, do, what do you guys, um, are, are, are you individually um, doing um, to aid in the film? Like, I, I really enjoyed those first couple of images um, where you're kind of looking around the house with that shaky um, camera. And I was just kind of wondering, I mean, is it the director who's saying that? Is it the director of photography? I don't know how close you guys, obviously, if you guys you know, are family, you kind of have to be it, closer, right? But, I mean. I'll let Sam speak in a second. Uh, it, it's a mix, though, I would say. I, you asked how do we, um, you know, separate our roles or how do we manage to get shaky shots and of, you know, B-roll and is it director of photography choosing that or director? Anyways, <clears throat> um, Sam has a natural eye for that type of uh, stuff. So it's nice for me that I can walk in and trust that he's going to go capture uh, images that, 
that are going to play well to the story. And then I can focus on speaking to the talent, so to speak, who's the person we're going to be interviewing with and build that comfort level. Because when you're running an interview, part, part of the upfront work is gaining comfort with them so they're comfortable in com conversation with you. So to have a second person that's solely responsible on the camera is like, uh, it's, uh, it's priceless. I mean, you, um, I've done both, Sam's done both. And it, I, I can tell you this, if you're running camera and running an interview, you're more focused on the camera. <laughs> Like just naturally, you're you ask questions and you're like, am I in focus? Am I? Is, how's the framing? Like, is it whatever? And that, and then the interview ends and you say, what the hell did I ask? Uh, what the hell did they say? And um, <clears throat> anyways, so to add on that though, being director, I will notice things and I will say, Sam, did you get that? Or Sam, did you get that? Or sometimes I'll just grab the camera and I will do it myself. Um, filmmakers that we like uh, also came from a documentary filmmaking like background. And <clears throat> you have to, like in that, you have to be run and gun ready. Like you have to be, um, so that shaky stuff, you know, obviously we're attracted to, um, you know, not. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but we're, we are, uh, we, so we're, we're attracted to that, but <clears throat> I will say I listen to uh, plenty of podcasts with filmmakers in Texas and Los Angeles um, and all around that are doing the same thing, and that brings comfort to me, like ones that I look up to um, that say as a director that they knew exactly that they wanted in a shot, and the cinematographer or the director of photography wasn't quite processing it, so they grabbed the camera themselves and went and did it and just to get it done with. Um, and so that I, I don't think it's uncommon. I think if you work with the times that it's common are going to be in those really polished like dolly slider shots or robot camera shots where everything is it's it's like math type in numbers and this is exactly what we want but when you come into a, an environment where you have this freedom to like look at the environment and say what can the environment do to tell, help, help me tell this story? I mean, the images of him, photos of him on the wall, his Star Trek memorabilia, Star Trek, um, Star Wars memorabilia, all those kind of things. We didn't know going in there what it was going to look like, but it helped us tell that story. If I went in and made a documentary on Leonard Oakland and I go into his office, there's plenty of just, oh, okay, well, he likes these films. And he like, <laughs> and that helps tell the story of of who Leonard Oakland is. So, um, <clears throat> so we're at 2.30. Um, is it we go at 2.50? 2 so cool, let me play this. Um, and I hope before you're done, you'll play one of your, I forget what you call it. The Daily Reel? Yes, Daily Reel. I can do that. If we can pull up some, uh, today's 245. No, go ahead. <laughs> So we have a really dear friend, Missy Wells, that um, had worked in PICU for like 15, 16 years. Gracie is like her, also her baby. Jen told me this morning, I dropped the boys off at school and she was like, hey, so you might be getting a call today. They want to interview, I, I, it's not my story. It's not my story. And she's like, yes, it is. You know it is. I just want a little perspective. So I text her, I go, I hate you right now. She's like, I know. I love you. <laughs> yeah, on September 13th, 2017, I was shot in the hallway of my school. Today we had a tragic event in Spokane County at the Freeman High School. My condolences go out to the community, the community at large, to the parents that waited with, uh, with me as we got the students reunited with them. I got a knock on my door that was my principal, and she said, Jen, I need you to open your door. 
So I walked over and um, she handed a phone, her phone to me and it was our superintendent, Randy. And he said, um, Jen, we've had a shooting and Grace has been shot, but we think she's gonna be okay. I could hear this was a different phone call just in the way her voice started. Instantly I went into, well, half denial, half nurse mode. First of all, it can't be Gracie. Like, who would shoot Gracie? She's Gracie. This is not the hard question. <laughs> I know. AMR 118 is about two minutes out with a 14-year-old female. She has a gunshot wound to her abdomen. Current it um, heart rate went through my right side, um, entered where the nerves come out of my vertebrae in L3, hit the fluid sac, changed trajectory, spun around and broke out the other side. It uh, nicked my kidney and tore my hip flexor and was lodged just under my skin. I was turning like 85. But... I pulled into Sacred Heart. I must have been driving like a maniac still because this awesome lady came running out. She said, are you a father? And I said, yes. She said, park it there. You know, the, the should have been's I think hit me the hardest. It should have been so much worse. That hole that the nerves come out, the bullet went like net net through that hole. So no damage of the spine going in, which is a big deal from what we understand because if it had fractured it at all, there's a real good, oh, that spine center so much pressure, that spinal cord, that it could, would go have, in there. It could have been the end. And I saw my people. You know, I saw the people that I had gone to war with. And they were fighting for Gracie. And to see all my favorites, like all the people that I would personally pick and choose to be there, were there to give her that care. I felt like I already knew them and I, the trust was there. I think the amazing part for us to have a facility like Sacred Heart Children's Hospital, that close where everyone could come, we could all gather, we didn't have to get in a uh, helicopter. Gracie didn't have to get in a helicopter to fly her over to who knows where. It was an amazing blessing. Have that kind of talent and that kind of facility that close to home was a blessing to us. And keep our support around us yeah, during absolutely. that time. Absolutely. Mom. Sorry. <laughs> I thought it was light shining up. Look at the cobwebs in my light. Oh, gross, <laughs> Mom. <laughs> Mom. Oh, my gosh. No, was that time you finished your thought? <laughs> That's an editing situation. Those are, like, the best. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to ask questions, you can. I have things I can say right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, so, obviously, it's not uncommon to use title cards. What was your decision process to use them in this one, this short? Um, to break it up, um, to break it up specifically, it was playing at a fundraiser, and I think it was kind of like, we didn't want to have an audible way to say like, oh, this is what the bullet did. We didn't need to use title cards. Um, I think it was a, a decision in the, at any, what is your name again? Sir? Austin. Austin. Were they distracting to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, no, that's a good question. We, uh, I think the, that's a good question. That was probably to evoke emotion. Um, the, the audio of, from the news with the helicopter, you can hear static, you hear like um, random, changes in sound it was weird it was eerie it was creepy because it was off of their old you know cameras and so we allowed that sound to play out in 
the, specifically the first time it cut to black. Um, and I think that was like just to keep that emotion of like, we wanted to take people back to that day because it was, <clears throat> this aired January 27th, 2018, this year. And September 13th could be seen as like, it was long enough that people had moved on with their lives. Um, and so we wanted to take people back to that day um, to put them to put them in that space again where they like felt it and felt like it had just happened um, in order to get the full impact of the rest of the story for the the hospital and children's miracle network and how they were able to help Gracie in her in her recovery um, so um, did that help answer some of it any other questions? You, you? What was the rationale behind uh, framing some of the interviews so close to the subject? <coughs> what interview specifically are you thinking? Grace, Gracie. Um, it was so close, it was like cutting off the top of her head as well. Um, and it seemed to me just really up there. Yeah, so we chose to inter have Gracie talk to the camera. In retrospect, we, we didn't, it was like, I would have done it again that way but I didn't have a reason. <laughs> um, it, it was like, oh, it'd be cool if she talks to the camera. In retrospect, I'm really happy that she did because um, the only time we used her talking to the camera was about the bullet. And the rest of the story was told by her parents and Missy Wells, the family friend. Um, and we made a goal to try to emphasize that this is a 14-year-old girl and she's a 14-year-old girl, like, period. Um, at the end of the day, like, we don't need her to sound intelligent about what happened that day. Um, we don't need her to sound, um, tell us any details that she may not feel comfortable talking about um, or may have to force. We wanted to emphasize that this is a 14-year-old girl and she, she wants to go to school and be a 14-year-old girl. She, that's all that and all I want in her life is just to be now a 15 year old girl who plays volleyball and basketball um, and so it was like really trying to elevate her in that way if that makes sense um, <clears throat> and so framing her that way I think it worked for us because it was like you got this weird eerie feel when she talks about the bullet but the other times that you see her she's laughing um, or she's making fun of her mom and which is really 14 year old uh, like the, that's what it is. So, um, anybody else? What's your name? Jeremy. Jeremy, thanks. And, and um, your name? Lou. Lou. Uh, so the hospital footage, where like they have the machines and everything, did you guys decide like afterwards that you need that? <coughs> How did you go about getting it? Um, good question. The hospital footage of them being um, the trauma center. We had. We had like major access to uh, the children's hospital in January. We were there um, at least half a dozen days <clears throat> for another series of documentary shorts that also aired that night. Um, and they said, well, would you guys like to film at the trauma center? And because they knew we were doing the Gracie story. We didn't know if it was going to make it in the final cut or not, but might as well. If you, at the time, we had, we had the time. And so if you have the time and somebody asks you to come film, like, do it. Uh, so, so we went down there, we got all this cool stuff, and we said, hey, can you do a code call of a shooting, um, a 14-year-old girl um, and whatever? And he, he said that, and we used it as the, the audio track to kind of like drive that this is what happened. Um, so anything else? Great question. <coughs> uh, we use a service called Artlist, um, and we use another service. We started using another service, and we've used it in the past called Musicbed. And Artlist is like 300 bucks a year, and it's unlimited downloads for licensing. Um, so that's the, the service that we use. How we choose is uh, you can search by genre, you can search, search by um, uh, mood, 
all these types of things. And when I'm watching something, I'm thinking, what, what do I want to evoke? And so I'll start searching moods or um, music or, or, or genres. The um, bullet, when she talks about that, it's this really like, like that's what I was thinking. I was like getting the chill down my spine when I hear her say it. And I'm like, I want to emphasize that. So I like chose some like horror haunting type I couldn't remember, I can't remember, Thriller or something. And I just went and searched for tracks. And when I found the one that I liked, we placed it in there and all of a sudden it like elevates the story that she's trying to say. Does that make sense or help you? <coughs> and your name? Yeah. Hannah, I'm trying with names, so um, cool. Anybody else? Josh. Um, I, I've noticed that you guys um, don't use any uh, uh, director or uh, title cards to talk about uh, your cells uh, other than that inland. Uh, is that something you guys usually do? Do you, I mean... <clears throat> Every, um, we do something called a daily reel that, um, that I'm going to answer your question. You asked about why do you not put titles or, or credits for director, director of photography, all that. Um, we've done it. We do, we just shipped a project to a construction company and it was very much a documentary short um, and they had built um, uh, these cottages for a uh, kind of halfway house for women and children called Transitions and so at the end there were so many people that worked on this project we ended it with credits because we felt like this has some weight. Um, this specific one uh, we chose just to keep with with Inland Film Co. Um, and I think part of that had to do with not dragging it on as well. Like we don't need to, it's enough to have our credit on there. Like we felt like that's cool for us. Um, we do daily reels, circling back to those. Every daily reel that we push out, whatever project it was for, we put the director, we put first AC if there was one, we put director of photography, we credit the musician um, and where we found their music. Um, and so we, if you go to our website, most films that we feature on our website, we have credits listed. So we're not doing it necessarily in the film, but we're doing it, right. um, <clears throat> yeah. So editor is a rare one that we credit because Sam and I edit so many things that it's like, it was one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so do you usually go in with a two-person crew, or do you have a sound person in addition? Ideally, if we could do, at a minimum, every uh, shoot with three people, uh, that would be awesome. But usually it's just Sam and I. But uh, with... Okay, man, I wish I had more time. The, that Gracie documentary, In the Home, there were too many chefs too many cooks, whatever. Um, people came in from the hospital and they wanted to be producer, director, and ask questions. And then we were also working with a person from the news station. Um, and uh, so sometimes more is better, but you gotta, they need to know exactly who their role is or what their role is. Um, but yeah, I mean, ideally we have a third person in the room, um, but usually it's just Sam and I. Uh, I'll play this really quick, and, and then this is this is uh, daily reel 200. We today is 245. We push out a mini film reel every single day, five days a week. Um, and um, in the the, I'm sure you've heard the term that uh, whatever is left over in a film, or on, like film is left on the ed editing room floor. This is our editing room floor. Like the scraps make it to the daily reels. Hello. 
So yeah, if you go to our um, playlist, 244, we'll release 245 today, um, 31 films for 10 capital. Anyways, you can just see all our work on our YouTube, or you can go to our website, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, you know. <laughs> um, I have business cards if everybody wants to, like, have them. Um, I'll pull them out. And if those of you have to leave, leave. If you don't, you can ask more questions. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you for, thank you for listening to me talk a lot about a little. Thank you for listening. The Cinetherapy Podcast is produced by Inland Film Co. Special thanks to Leonard Oakland and Whitworth University for hosting me and inviting me to present. And that's a wrap.